first hymn. So welcome to worship this morning here in the sanctuary on Zoom and on the Facebook page too. Perhaps in the sanctuary here, you'll be aware of a little doorbell ringing every now and again um, when Hannah was singing our invocation. That's a wee technical thing um, that enables us to know when somebody is waiting to come into the Zoom worship space. So that's why you hear that occasionally. Also this morning, um, I just wanted to mention for the first time in um, a long time, we have fresh flowers here on our table. And these are because um, are in memory of Karen Thompson. She's the granddaughter of Flo Drummond. And occasionally um, she would come here with her family to worship, um, particularly around about Christmas. We loved having her here. Um, unfortunately, and sadly, she died um, a week or so ago. And although we weren't hosting her funeral, her family wanted the flowers to come here. And we're so grateful for that and to be able to remember her and her family in our worship and our prayers today too. We're going to begin our worship by listening as Nancy plays for us and we can read the words through on the screen. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of darkness, shining. Rab and Barbara, I think at the back, for, for clapping. We may not be able to expel air by singing, but we are allowed to worship in all sorts of other ways too. Barry is going to lead us now in our opening prayer. Thanks. Let's come before God in prayer. Let's all pray. 
Almighty God, we come today reminded of your greatness, your glory, your sovereign power and eternal purpose expressed so wonderfully in Jesus Christ. Risen and ascended, worthy as a lamb that was slain to receive power and wealth, wisdom and might, honor and glory and blessing. We thank you for the wonder of ascension, that marvelous yet mysterious moment in the life of the apostles, which left them gazing heavenward in confusion and yet departing in joy. We thank you for the way it brought the ministry of Jesus to a fitting conclusion, testifying decisively to his oneness with you, demonstrating your final seal of approval on all that he had done. We thank you that through his ascension, Jesus was set free to be Lord of all, no longer bound to a particular place or time, but with us always and able to reach to the ends of the earth. We thank you that through his departing, Jesus prepared the way for his coming again through his spirit, through his church and his coming again in glory. Almighty God, forgive us for so often failing to grasp the wonder of ascension, for living each day as though it had never been. Forgive the smallness of our vision, the narrowness of our outlook, the feebleness of our love, the nervousness of our witness, our repeated failure to recognize the fullness of your revelation in Christ. Give us a deeper sense of wonder, a stronger faith, and a greater understanding of all that you have done. Almighty God, like the apostles, we too will never fully understand all that ascension means. But we accept, but we don't fully understand. We believe, yet we have many questions. Help us despite our uncertainty to hold firm to the one great truth that the wonder of Christ was far beyond anything we can ever imagine. And in that faith, may we live each day. In the name of the risen and the ascended Christ, who gave us these words, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Barry. As Barry mentioned in his prayer, the theme for today is going to be Ascension. Ascension actually happened on Thursday, the way the church calendar works. Ascension always um, falls ahead of Pentecost by about 10 days or so. And so I thought as I was preparing for today, I would use that as our theme. And I want to put this into a bigger context before um, I read the account of it in scripture. And have this in the back of your mind. Now, I know in some congregations, this is read every single week. It's not something that we use a lot here at St. Leonard's. But I want you to hear the words that we would perhaps have said at a, at a baptism or possibly at a communion um, on another occasion. The words of the creed or one of the creeds, the Apostles' Creed is what I'm going to use. And see if you can spot where ascension fits within the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. I believe, let me put my, my notes in twice. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Hope you managed to spot the ascension in there. We will come back to it in a moment. But first, our readings. The first is from the very tale of John's of Luke's gospel, chapter 24. After Jesus had rose again, and after he had met some of the disciples, at verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. And Luke picks it up in his, um, his second installment in Acts, the letter that he wrote that we use for the story of the apostles. Let me read from the first chapter and see how Luke picks up where he left off. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white <coughs> stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has, take, has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So it occurred to me the other week, as I was looking at some of the significant dates around this time, planning ahead and fitting things in, that I have never actually preached on Christ's ascension. At least, not that I remember. Now, you know my memory is bad, so I may have done, but I don't remember ever preaching on this. That may sound scandalous. But you have to remember, as I said, that ascension day usually falls um, during the week. It's rarely on a Sunday, although actually last year I think it maybe did. But this year it was a Thursday. And although I had all of my notes prepared by the end of Wednesday, I doubt that many of you would have answered an urgent call to come and listen to the sermon just because it was ready for Thursday morning. It strikes me, coming to it afresh, that the ascension of Jesus Christ is kind of the coup's tail of our celebrations of Jesus. 
you know, we think about Christmas, we think about Easter, we remember all of these other ones, and you'll remember, no doubt, um, last year, Margaret preaching on Christ the King Sunday too. But Ascension is, is kind of around there somewhere at the back of our list. I remember being chided by an older colleague back in my early ministry that it was all very well for me to preach that God had an amazing plan of salvation from the point of our fall from grace and um, Jesus' incarnation, life and death for our sakes has been built into God's interaction with us right the way through the Old Testament. And I often preached on that, um, that kind of theme and structure in my early days. But said my friend, don't stop at Christ's death. Always move forward to Christ's resurrection. It's glorious. Well, nowadays, I move forwards again to Christ's ascension and also his coming again but that's maybe for another time in the words of the the creeds all of them and the one I've just read it's all there but it's particularly joyous and I wonder if you noticed it that the ascension in the creed brings about a use of the present tense up until that point everything is in the past tense he was born he died and so on and then Jesus ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father. All of a sudden, we get into the present. The accounts of the ascension are tiny wee narratives in the big scheme of things, but they are mighty. As the ascension is about Jesus' returning to the Father to prepare an abiding, an ongoing present place for us with God. So let's have a wee look at the text a little bit further. Jesus has spent time with a couple of his disciples on the road to Emmaus, that wonderful account that we often come to after Easter. And then while they are telling um, their friends of this, he appears to them all. There's a wee intriguing throwaway comment about how Jesus has appeared to Simon Peter. That's one of those mysteries we'll have to ask about in glory because it's not recorded anywhere else. And then in the presence of the risen Christ, everyone is a little stunned. So Jesus eats with them to prove he is physically resurrected. And then he goes on to unfold the plan I mentioned earlier using the scriptures and then recruiting them now as witnesses to the both completed and ongoing fulfillment of God's purposes. Remember the way we learned in 1 John over these last few weeks about how we get to be incorporated into that experience of the first witnesses, because this isn't just their calling and identity, it's ours too. Why this is really important, I'll explain in a moment. And then there's this beautiful moment out on the hillside around Bethany when Jesus lifts up his hands, hands that bear the scars of crucifixion, and he blesses them. Sound familiar? You've only looked at this scene every Sunday for however long you've been a part of St. Leonard's, and maybe Ewan can put that up on the screen for the Zoomers especially to be able to see. I think you've been flicking to it actually throughout the morning as a subliminal messaging technique that this is where we're at. So above our table, you can see Jesus. You can see him lifting up his hands, surrounded by his disciples, standing. I noticed actually this last year, I've been coming in here quite a lot when no one else could. Um, and having my quiet times in here, and often looking up at this picture. And I've noticed um, that what Jesus is standing on, can you see it? It's the stump of Jesse, right at his feet. There we go. Excellent zeroing in. Thank you for that, Ewan. You can see the stump of Jesse that Jesus is standing on. That's the Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah, the Savior that will come of the line of David. And he raises his wounded hands in blessing and then ascends to heaven. 
Luke picks up his own story, as I said, in Acts and then reprises the role of a couple of angels. Now, if you've been paying attention over the last few Christmases, you'll maybe have picked up that I have a bit of a thing about the two angels that met the disciples at the tomb on the morning of um, Christ's resurrection. I don't mean Christmases, I mean Easter's. Um, when I write these kind of services, I often imagine these two angels as being the angels sent to cast out Adam and Eve and then to guard, and then guard Eden, Eden. I like the idea that though they had to witness that horrible day at the beginning of all things, they one day will get to witness the glorious day of the resurrection. Well, this week I have found myself wondering if they also went on to serve at the ascension. Wouldn't that be brilliant? Because just as the two angels at the tomb ask the disciples why they are looking for the living among the dead, now these two angels ask the disciples why they are standing around looking up into the sky. So what do we need to know about the ascension? Why is it significant? Literally, what does it signify for us? Let's just have a wee recap about how it fits into the scheme of things. Here I'm grateful to a theologian at the Lutheran Cemetery, uh, Cemetery? Seminary in the States for his characterization. He talks about the incarnation, first of all, how the Son of God takes on human flesh. And he describes it as misery loving company because we were miserable. We were in a miserable state, needing the Son of God to come and be incarnated among us. Misery loves company. And then he talks about the crucifixion. Misery upon misery loves company. It's an awful thing to walk through in preparation for Easter Sunday. And then resurrection. And he talks about how this is about the Son of God achieving victory over death, which is amazing and brilliant. But he says we need something even more than that. He says we need the ascended Christ. We need the ascension. We need um, the resurrected Christ that makes a way back to God for himself, but far more significantly for us. Others had been resurrected before, but they all died again later in the fullness of time. Lazarus died again. Jesus doesn't die again but opens a way that we can follow him through we use this phrase actually in the burial service about how christ opens a door that we follow him through into the life of god himself into the very presence of god into life with capital letters itself that life to come remember first john the life to come the abundant life, the eternal life in the eternal pre presence of the eternally living God. United with Christ, we start to live the time that is to come now. And united to Christ in his death, resurrection and ascension, we walk together a path that leads us closer and closer into the presence of God. That's a wow moment for me. What does it mean for the here and now? It means in the present tense that Jesus, our Lord and Savior is seated at the right hand of the Father, talking with God on our behalf. There's that phrase in the scripture about interceding for us. So he's talking with God about about you and about me. But more than that, because that tends towards us thinking of all of this in kind of spatial terms here and there and us down here and Jesus up there. Jesus says that, that though we witness to everyone, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth down here, we don't do so alone because the spirit of God is poured out upon us and through us. The disciples asked about a very physical restoration of the kingdom of Israel in this particular geographical space. And Jesus made it not about one nation, but about all nations, indeed the whole earth. So the ascension is 
a big awe moment, which enables the early church and pray God the 2000 years later church too, to know themselves rooted in worshipful awe and reverence of our ascended Lord, and to pray in the power of God who can not only raise Jesus to life, but cause Jesus to open this pathway for us straight into the throne room of God himself. Often a companion reading is set to the accounts of the ascension. So I'm going to read you one of those from Ephesians 1. And maybe this will start showing us how to pray for the church of Christ in the days to come. So Paul writes this. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, so far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. So although we can't sing with our tongues, we sing with our hearts. Alleluia, sing to Jesus, his the scepter, his the throne, alleluia, his the triumph, his the victory alone. Hark, the songs of peaceful Zion thunder like a mighty flood. Jesus, out of every nation, has redeemed us by his blood.
Kinanzi, powerful playing of amazing words. So let's bring our world before God in prayer now, joining our intercessions with those of Jesus himself. Let's pray. Holy God, we are a world that is desperate for you. When powers struggle for dominance and war, oppression and abuse result, when groups of people oppose one another because of ideology, religion or culture, we need a God who is bigger than ourselves and our personal interests. So Lord, we bring to mind those areas <coughs> of conflict in the world that perhaps resonate closely with us, maybe India or Israel, Palestinian territories, Afghanistan, places that maybe don't reach the headlines just now. When people are disregarded and devalued because of poverty, geography or disease, when compassion and justice is withheld from some because of sexuality, race or gender, we need a savior who is more compassionate than we are, who includes even those we might exclude. Or there are some perhaps within our own consciences, within our own hearts, we lift before you. And just now we think particularly of our young people bearing just one of the weights of this pandemic as they sit their assessments and face increasing uncertainty in their future. Be with them and their families, we pray. When resources are mismanaged and abused and the world and its creatures are destroyed, when motivation is scarce and creativity is in short supply to address the challenges that we face, we need a spirit who is more powerful and more creative than we could ever be. So Lord, we pray for all those seeking to be a part of the solution, particularly to the major issue of our time climate crisis and we think particularly of those working behind the scenes just now preparing for the massive push later this year to get the commitment of world leaders to face this issue lord bless the work of their hands we pray and we think too now in the quiet of some of our own in great need facing ill health uncertainty difficult choices Lord God, loving Saviour, empowering Spirit, we offer you these prayers because we need you so desperately. Captivate us, call us and fill us that we may be carriers of your eternal life to this world that you love so dearly. There are some intimations just to share um, amongst us this morning before um, I let you go from various platforms today. So um, last week was Christian Aid Week and we, we focused on that particularly at our last service. So thank you to everyone who has been involved in that through the, the prayers running, through the meetings happening, through um, supporting those who have been doing various um, walks, runs and so on um, to raise money for Christian Aid. I promised you here in the sanctuary that there would be envelopes if you wanted to contribute. And so I think those are available at the door um, as you leave. And certainly online, you've had links for the e-envelopes if you were able to contribute that way. My thanks to you. The total at the moment um, is in excess of 1,600. Um, I think it will be well in excess of that by now. That was a, a total from earlier in the week. So I appreciate that we made a commitment to make sure that our giving to the needs of others and the work of others on our behalf around the world would not be less during this pandemic. So thank you for being a part of that commitment. I also um, have put on the email um, lists, um, on the, the link that went out, the, um, the newsletter from the street pastor, pastors. I'm getting my words muddled up today. This is really interesting if you get the chance to have a look at it online um, or if you'd like a copy of it in print then let us know we'll see if we can get one dropped to you so the dunfermline street pastors over the last few months have become the fife street pastors we've linked up um kirkoddy and uh not 
Cowden Booth, Glenn Rothis, um, together. Um, and they're working in harness at the moment. And we supported them um, last year during the pandemic as well. And they're beginning to be able to get out there and do some outreach work and work with people in need, particularly during the nighttime economy as that begins to, to, to pick up too. So if you want to find out more about them, you can either Google them or let me know and I can let you have the, um, the newsletter. And finally, um, the prayer course restarted on Wednesday, um, particularly looking this time at the issue of unanswered or differently answered prayer. Uh, this is a wee add on to the original course that we did earlier in the year. Um, and so there's a session on a Wednesday at 7.30 and then it gets reprised on the Sunday evening at 7. So if you'd like to join us on Zoom tonight, you'd be very welcome to do that. Um, those, I think, are all the intimations I need to mention to everybody this morning. We're going to close. You already know that one. That's really for the, the folks out at um, on Zoom that people are welcome to come in um, and make use of the sanctuary either during the service on a Sunday or, of course, through the week on Tuesdays and Fridays. Sorry, I forgot to mention that as well. Thanks for you and for putting that up. So we're going to close with the Makaton blessing you'll be beginning to get used to this here in the sanctuary now um, as we are on zoom um, we're using this throughout the year just the first part of it as a way of blessing one another uh, particularly being able to do so using the makaton actions um, so please feel free to join with that at home or here in the sanctuary if you're beginning to get confident with some of the actions and i'll dip out part way through um, just to set up Zoom rooms for breakout rooms for the Zoomers. Uh, and then I'll pop back in to say goodbye to folks here too. So let's sing or do the actions for the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord bless you. His face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. His face shine upon you and be gracious to you.